Um, for those of you that just joined, Parth and I, we, we were just talking about some questions about checkout for the Boyd's lab. So I thought I'd just start by going over a few of those things. The, this 30 frames per second deadline, if you're animating your screen, your animation is going to look okay down to significantly lower than 30 frames per second. If, if it's at 15 frames per second, the animation is going to look passable. It's going to look okay. So for your checkout, I need, I need you to prove to me somehow that you're hitting 30 frames per second. Um, you could do that by printing out the amount of time that you're de delaying in your, um, in your animation thread. Or you could do something much leaner, like Bruce which was suggesting, which is if you are um, yielding for a pot, if, if your yield time is greater than zero, which is to say your meeting deadline, print a single character on the TFT display that says, yes, I met deadline. And if not, print a different character or print no character. Just some mechanism by which you can show that you're keeping track of frames per second and you can prove to me that you're meeting that deadline. Once you prove that, if you then want to eliminate that part of the code so that you can increase the number of voids somewhat, that's okay. And then we can see how big you can make your flock when you have very little else going on in the CPU. But you need to prove to me that you're hitting that 30 frames per second deadline at least most of the time. If every now and then for particular configurations, it blips a little bit, that's okay. But you can't be you know, averaging something like 15 frames a second. I need, you need to prove that you're being conscious about frame rate. Um, any, any questions about lab two expectations? I've been, I was, I've been wandering around uh, 238 looking at everyone's TFT displays and I see a lot of voids flying around. So it seems like things are going pretty well. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to go over them. Um, I do, uh, is there a way to man, um, focus the camera on by TFT uh, on the TFT screen from our end because my camera is not focused computer on the TFT screen. No, not from your end, but if you come to office hours today, I can adjust the height of your camera until it is focused properly. Uh, they don't have an adjustable focus. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? I have a couple of. Um, as usual, I want to start with a, a, just a couple of bugs that I saw in lab this week so that people can keep an eye on them as they work on uh, the remainder of lab two. Um, the first bug, oh, and this is a sneaky one. The, the first one is, particularly if you're used to working in Python, if you call printf and you want to print out some string, you must use double quotes to contain that string and not single quotes. Uh, C will interpret double quotes differently than single quotes. This really probably, this should throw an error probably, but it doesn't. Um, the exactly how, to, how printf interprets single quotes, I'm not sure. In general, if you put a character in single quotes, that gives you the ASCII, it gives you the ASCII code for that character as an integer. So if you were to put zero in single quotes, you would get ASCII code for zero, which is 48. Uh, if you were to put the character A in single quotes, you would get uh, 65. Um, so just be careful about that. If you are printing strings, double quotes. Use double quotes. That's a subtle bug, and it doesn't really tell you what's the, the error message is not particularly clear. So just keep an eye on that. Um, but the symptom is it resets. Yeah. It, which is really bewildering. Um, also be careful, I did see, recall too that, we're gonna look at this in, in lecture today if we have time, but the UART channel is set up behind the scenes when you call PT setup, proto thread setup. That's what's doing the peripheral pin select mapping of the UART pins to particular IO ports. If you have kept, attempt to call a printf before in main before calling PT setup, that's not gonna work either because you don't yet have that uh, communication channel set up. You haven't actually set up the UART yet. Okay, so keep an eye on that bug as well. Um, the other slightly subtle thing is in one step of this algorithm, at least sort of um, 
implemented in a straightforward way. In one step of this algorithm, you are calculating a square root. Remember that that square root, in order to use the square root function, you need to include math.h, one of the standard libraries. You need to include math.h at the top of your file. So if you are starting from an example that does not include math.h and you've forgotten to include it, when you click build, the compiler is going to throw a warning. It's going to say something like a implicit definition of function square root, but it's not going to throw an error. So, and the symptom of this will be that that implicitly defined square root function will return zero, which means when you divide by that value, you're going to get a divide by zero and your CPU is going to reset over and over and over again. Okay, so, so keep an eye on that. Uh, make sure if you're using math functions, make sure you include math.h at the top of your file. Um, the other thing I just want to remind people of, I'm going to share my screen. So this is true of the TFT display and it's true of, of display screens in general. Um, if you look at this TFT display, where is pixel zero zero here? Top left. Top left, yeah. So it is not in the center of the screen. The, or, the pixel zero zero is not the center of the screen. Pixel zero zero is the upper left here. And then the value of the pixels increases across and down. So pixel two, pixel three nineteen two thirty nine is down here in the lower right. Okay. Now, as you, you can call that TFT set rotation function that changes the orientation of the TFT display screen. So if you change the orientation, you may place pixel 00 in one of these other corners, but pixel 00 will be in, for your particular orientation, the upper left corner of the screen. And probably all of you are using this sort of landscape orientation. So it's gonna be in the upper left corner of the screen. So something to keep in mind with this is I've seen a few groups that are testing a single Boyd flying around the screen and they are initializing it with equal velocities in X and Y direction, but they are spawning it very near to the edge of the TFT display outside of that turnaround margin. If you spawn the Boyd there, then it will instantly Velocity will be added instantly because the program thinks that it has entered and needs to turn around. So you'll end up with a boy that is accelerating in one direction away from the wall of the screen. And you'll have excess velocity in one dimension and what looks like not enough velocity in the other dimension. So the boy will sort of bounce slowly up and down or left and right and quickly in the other dimension. And the question is, why is my boy moving faster in one direction and then the other? when I initialized it with equal velocity in each direction. And it's for this reason. If you, if you generate it, if you spawn it too close to the, to the edge of the screen, which is to say on the outside of your margin where they start turning around, then it's gonna to accelerate towards the center of the screen. Any questions about that? Any other bugs that people have been seeing that they're working through, anything weird? Okay, it does appear, by the way, uh, if the lighting in the lab is correct, individual pixels are visible on the TFT display. So what that implies is if you want to represent a Boyd as a single pixel, um, as long as we have the lights off in the lab, that's visible. And that's gonna save you a lot of cycles and you'll get a bigger flock. So keep that in mind. You may want to continue to debug with Boyd's represented as chunkier circles, just so that they're maybe slightly more visible. Um, but when you're trying to really turn up the number of Boyd's in the flock, we can set the lighting in the lab such that individual pixels are visible and you can represent each Boyd as an individual pixel. Okay. Questions? The other thing I just wanted to mention, some of you have already found this, but on the homepage for the Canvas site, there's a Google form set up where if you want to 
hear about any particular topic. It could be a topic that we've already covered that you wanna cover again, um, or it could be something that we haven't covered. Anything approximately related to prototyping with microcontrollers is fine. Just put it in that Google form and I wanna accumulate a list of stuff that people wanna hear about. So far, I've uh, um, that list, is the, the, the topics that have been submitted to that Google form include direct memory access, Networking, which I interpret as like TCP IP stuff, but if I'm wrong about that interpretation, just talk to me about it. And robot operating systems. Um, I'm definitely gonna talk about DMA. I think I'll talk about that on Monday. The networking stuff, I might, we'll talk about that, but I might put that off until after lab four when we're working on final projects and we can do some more sort of special topics kind of lectures. But Anything that you'd like to add to that list, please just add something to that list. And I don't promise that we'll cover it, uh, but I promise that I will think about covering it. And if it's relevant, then we will cover it, okay? Okay, uh, in that, unless there are questions then, I'll get into the content for today. Um, and what I wanna do today is, is, I attempt to, what we've been doing for much of this course is we sort of started with this big um, demo file, right? Where you all started with the lab zero and we're sort of incrementally removing mystery from that file, at least that's my hope. Uh, and what I wanna do today is talk specifically about UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter this is because this is the mechanism by which our Python code is talking to the PIC32. And it's the mechanism by which the PIC32 is talking back to the Python code. So we are using this extensively. We use this in, in uh, lab one and we're gonna use this in every lab. And we've sort of just been treating it almost like a black box. So what I wanna do today is just sort of peek inside the black box and explain a little bit how this stuff is working. Mostly this is for your interest, it's not, um, well, in any case, it's, it's, it's stuff that's good to know. If you were to continue to use those plib function calls as black boxes, you would be just fine in lab. Um, but it's good to know what's going on under the hood, right? So this is what I'm going to talk about. The UART is, it's a protocol just like, um, not just like, but in the same way that serial peripheral interface is a protocol by which two devices can communicate with one another. And I2C is another protocol by which uh, two or more devices can communicate with one another. UART is another one of these protocols. So I'm gonna talk through it in a way that is very similar to the way that we talked through SPI and I2C, which is we're gonna look at the uh, hardware hookup, and then we are going to talk through the protocol. And then I wanna show you in code how we actually implement this protocol. So we'll start with hooking up the hardware. Um, this I will say is one of the nice things about UART is the hardware hookup is even simpler than hooking up I squared C devices. Like I squared C devices, there are two lines, um, RX and TX. RX you can interpret as receive, TX you can interpret as transmit. The one slight gotcha that always gets people when hooking up UART devices is to remember that the TX of one device gets hooked up to the RX of the other device. And this kind of makes sense. You want for whatever device one is transmitting to be received by device two. But if you're used to hooking up I2C or SPI buses where MISO goes to MISO and MOSI goes to MOSI and SCL goes to SCL, it's an easy mistake to make to forget that TX goes to RX in both directions, okay? So information that is sent by device one gets received by device two. Information that is sent by device two gets received by device one. Um, this is full duplex. So both devices can be talking to one another at the same time. And you will notice that what makes this, this uh, schematic different than the schematics that we have considered so far which have been SPI and I2C is there's no clock line. So on the SPI hardware diagram, there was a S clock line. On the I2C diagram, there was an SCL line and the communications were synchronous, which is to say that 
the data on the data line was sent synchronously with clock pulses on the clock line so that the device sending the data and the device receiving the data had a shared clock and the pulses on that clock were on that clock line. This does not have that. This is where the asynchronous in universal asynchronous receiver transmitter comes from. There is no shared clock. Um, instead, each device has its own clock and they synchronize their clocks based on a start signal from the device that is starting the transmission. And we're gonna look at this in a moment in the timing diagram. Any questions about this? Okay, so let's look at the timing diagram. Um, this protocol as compared to something like I2C is, is extremely simple. Um, like I2C, when these lines are idle, which is to say there's no communication taking place, they are by default at high voltage. And then the transmitting device toggles the line low. So you can see that when this line is idle, it's at high voltage. The signal of a transmission starting is the, in the case of the transmitting device, the TX line, which remember is connected to the RX line of the receiving device, that is pulled low for one bit time. And this indicates the start of the transmission. So when the receiving device sees this line go low, this is the signal to the receiving device to start its own clock. So this is what synchronizes the clock on the transmitter and the clock on the receiver. This implies that these two clocks need to be running at the same rate and they do. They need to be running at the same rate and they need to be synchronized to within something like 2% in order for this to work. So this is why, um, well, well, we'll get to that, but this is why it's so, one of the reasons it's so important to have your baud rate agreement between transmitter and receiver because there is no shared clock line. So they both need to agree before any transmissions take place. They need to agree on the rate at which those bits are going to be coming. So there's a start bit and then there's a start bit, the receiver starts its clock and then the receiver will check the voltage on this line to get each subsequent bit in the packet. It's gonna be an eight bit packet. It could be configured to nine bits. We'll talk about that. There are some applications where we do that, but generally speaking, it's an eight bit packet. Um, and then there is a stop bit, which is this line being pulled high once again after these eight bits have been received. So you can see that because there's a start bit, a stop bit and eight data bits, it takes us 10 bit times to transmit eight bits. We need to transmit 10 total bits in order to transmit eight bits of data. Each of those bits is transmitted in an amount of time that is equal to one over the baud rate. We've talked a lot about baud rate in this class and we talked about how you set the baud rate for the PIC32 in that config.h file and that that baud rate needs to agree with the baud rate that you configure in the Python file. The baud rate is the seconds or the it's the bits per second for that for each device on that channel and that those two those two bits per second uh, settings need to agree for both transmitter and receiver. So because that's a measure of bits per second, the amount of seconds per bit is one over the baud rate. So in our case, we're using a rate of one one five two zero zero bits per second. So the amount of time that it takes to send one bit is one over 115200. The amount of time that it takes to send one character, which is eight bits, is 10 times one over 115200. Does that make sense? Um, there are some configurations that you can set up. So you can configure the number of clock pulses per bit. So both the transmitter and the receiver have a synchronized clock. They aren't sending, there is not one bit sent per clock pulse, but a bit will last a certain number of clock pulses. And you can configure that to be either four or 16. The advantage of setting this lower 
only four clock pulses per bit is you can transmit faster. The disadvantage is less reliability for each bit because there's less pieces of information about what that bit was. If you have 16 clock pulses per bit, you're sampling that bit quite a number of times to make sure that you've gotten it right. And then you move on to the next bit. But this implies that you can transmit at speeds as high as one fourth the clock rate. So on the PIC32, you could in principle transmit through a UART channel at, at one fourth of 40 megahertz, which is 10 megahertz. Um, you're not gonna be able to transmit very far at 10 megahertz over a UART, but you could transmit at that rate over a UART channel. And like I said, this, this correctly implies that synchronization is important here because we're not sharing a clock, we're synchronizing clocks. Those two clocks need to be synchronized to within about 2%. Questions or comments about this? Um, Hunter, yeah. I, wondered, yeah. I was wondering, uh, what does it mean receiver starts at, uh, starts at clock was um, won't the receiver have its own clock on which it's running and doing its own operation? So you, so. Think of it as phase locking the clock to that edge. The receiver is going to use that clock to know when to sample the data line. And the transmitter is using its own clock to know when to put data on that data line. And we want for those two clocks to be in phase with one another so that the receiver is sampling when at the proper time, when the transmitter has put data on the data line. If they're out of sync, you could imagine that the receiver, if, if it's sampling this data line, say four times per bit, you would not want for the receiver to sample two bits here and then two bits here. Right, so it's basically phase locking, right, to the... That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And if it seems to any of you that this is an awfully primitive protocol, it's because it is. It was invented over 100 years ago. In fact, one of the artifacts... It's, it's interesting to learn the history of some of these things. Why, is these, why are these idle high, active low? This actually goes back to telegraph machines um, where they wanted the idle state of the lines in the telegraph machines to be high and then they're active low so that if something breaks, it's obvious that, oh, that line that should be at high voltage is at low voltage. So we know that that line is physically broken, it makes it easier to debug. If these were idle low, active high, then when the telegraph machine was sitting there and you weren't transmitting the symptom of a broken line in your telegraph machine would be less obvious. So this idle high state goes back all the way to telegraphs. Um, a common use case for UART, the use case that we've been using, by the way, is to um, get data to a human user. So the way that we do this is we use some sort of a UART to serial bridge, a UART to USB bridge. In our case, we're using these blue dongles from Adafruit that we occasionally have to unplug and replug. What those dongles are actually doing is on one end, they are connecting to the RX and TX lines of the PIC32. They go through a converter that makes them look like a serial COM port to the PC that we can plug into a USB port. And then on the PC, you can fire up your Python code, which is how most of you have been interacting with the PIC and see the data that, get, that gets uh, sent from the PIC. Um, or alternatively, you can fire up something like PuTTY, which is a terminal emulator, where you set the COM port, you set the baud rate, and then it will show you the data coming from the PIC32. PuTTY is a terminal emulator. PuTTY emulates the, see if I can remember this. PuTTY emulates the VT100, I think, which itself is an emulator. I don't remember this whole regression, but it's emulations of emulations. Bruce, do you remember this regression? Oh, part of it. There's, uh, the VT100 is an emulation of, of a teletype, 
which is an emulation of the old telegraph standard. And so the, 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 the teletype was a mechanical machine with a maximum baud rate, by the way, of 110 baud. 111 bits, 11 characters a second. Okay. Any questions about this protocol? Because the next thing I want to talk about are um, the error states that you can get on a UART channel. And it makes sense to talk about th those error states make the most sense when this protocol is clear. So I hope this protocol is clear. It's not particularly complicated. Start your clock is indicated by a pull low on that data line. And then it's bit, 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 bit eight bits and then an indication that the transmission is over. By the way, something I forgot to mention is this stop bit, the end of this stop bit, there will be some sort of, on the receiving device, some sort of inter internal signal that there is now a byte available in the UART receive buffer. Because this is asynchronous, this byte could appear at any time. So when this stop bit appears and the receive device knows, okay, I've got a bit in my UART receive buffer, it will signal that somehow. It will throw an interrupt perhaps, okay? It will somehow let the CPU know that there is data there to be gotten. And then the CPU will take some action to go get the information from that buffer, clear the buffer and get ready for the next transmission. Okay. So what are the possible error states for this? Um, you could probably guess these based on what this protocol is, but one of these error states is you could get a framing error, which is the receiver sees this, this start signal. So it starts its clock. Because you've configured the baud rate, it knows how many bits are being sent each second. And it also knows how many bits are going to be contained in a single packet. So it has a, it can anticipate when this stop bit is going to come. If it does not see the stop bit at the expected time, that's a framing error, right? So this implies perhaps that some sort of desynchronization has taken place between the sender and receiver, or it implies that the, the sender has continued to send bits somehow and not sent this, somehow this stop bit was not received um, and a framing error was thrown, make sense? The data is framed between the start and stop bit. If that framing gets screwed up, if the stop bit does not appear where it's supposed to be, then that's a framing error. You will see these error states in the, on the PIC32, there are um, UART status registers where just like we, we looked at the control and status regis registers for the SPI channel, which allowed us to configure the channel and then allowed us to look at things like, is this SPI channel busy or not by checking the value of a particular bit in a particular register. Very similarly on the PIC32 and on essentially all microcontrollers with this sort of hardware peripheral, there's a register for the UART status and a particular bit in that register will indicate a framing error or a parity error or an overrun error, which we'll talk about in a moment, okay? But information about the error state of this channel is indicated by some status register. A parity error is if you have the UART channel configured to parity mode, what that means is that in addition to the data bits, it will send one additional bit that is the parity of the packet, which is to say, if you were to add up all of the ones and zeros in that packet, is the resulting sum of those numbers. You can think about this as adding them up. You could also think about this as um, performing a, a logical combination of them. Do you end up with an odd or an even number at the end? If you end up with an odd number, set a one. If you end up with an even number, send a zero. If then on the receiver side, you do the same operation and you calculate the parity of the data that you've received and there's a mismatch, then you know that one of your bits was screwed up, at least one of them. If two were screwed up and they were screwed up in such a way that the parity stays the same, then well, you're not gonna catch that error. But the idea is that if you have single errors in your packet someplace where a bit gets flipped, this parity allows for you to check to make sure that yes, the parity of the packet that are ICs 
matches the parity of the packet that the transmitter calculated and sent along with the packet. If there's a mismatch, you get a parity error. Um, an overrun error occurs if the receiver, like I said, at the, at the end of this stop bit, the receiver will signal to the CPU somehow, probably by means of an interrupt. There's data in this buffer. Please go process it and clear the buffer. If another packet comes before the receiver has had time to do that and to clear the buffer, then you will get an overrun error. A break condition is not an error, but it looks to the receiver like an error. Um, to send a break condition, the transmitter will hold this line low for longer than a character time. So for longer than these eight bits, which to the receiver will look like, so the receiver will see a start condition. It'll start its clock. It's gonna look like it received a character of all zeros and then a framing error because it will not see the stop bit where it expected it because the line is gonna be continued to be held low by the transmitter. Where have we seen a break condition get used? Anybody notice this in the Python code? I'm not sure if I mentioned this explicitly. But this is, this is Bruce's clever hack, <laughs> frankly, for, for the, the software reset in your Python GUI. You can check the, the reset toggle button and push the reset um, button in your GUI and it resets the CPU. I, actually, I think I, yeah, let me show you this quickly. In the Python code, uh, where am I looking here? I'm looking. Sorry, just got, ah, here it is. Okay, okay. So if event zero to three is uh, RTG, which is to say the reset button has been pushed, then you can see that instead of doing what we usually do in response to GUI interactions, which is, okay, figure out was this a button push and which button was it? Or was this a toggle slider and which slider was it? And what's the value of that slider of that button? And encoding that in a packet and sending it on. What we send in the event of a reset push is a break condition. Like we just talked about, what that break condition actually does is pull the transmit line for the PC, the transmit line on the receipt on the PIC32 side that's going into the RX pin. It pulls that low for longer than a character time. Okay, why is this useful? Well, if we look at the If we look at the uh, remote learning PCB that's hooked up to each of your PIC32s, we can see that this is the RX pin here. This goes through a filter and is connected to the reset pin on the PIC32. So when you send a break condition so that that is held low for long enough, then the reset pin on the PIC32 will be pulled low, which does a hardware reset of the PIC32. So this is why, uh, this is not a software reset of the PIC32. This is an actual hardware reset and it's a hack of this break condition. Because this is being held for long enough, we can filter that and reset the, uh, the we can toggle the reset line of the PIC32 by sending a break condition. So these error states make sense. Framing, parity, overrun. And you can send break conditions if you want to. Okay, so now we can get, a, if you wanna get a little twisted. Another thing you can do, uh, we probably won't be doing this in this class because it would require that each bench has more PIC32s or something set up with it. But suppose you wanted to set up a UART network so that you could have multiple devices networked using the UART protocol and by talking through their UART pins. The way that you can do this is you put every TX and RX line on the same wire with diodes between the uh, going into every TX line. And then you gently pull up that wire with a, with a pull up resistor. What this allows for you to do is because of the orientation of these diodes, these TX lines 
they're able to pull that line low and then the, the resistor will gently pull it back up once the TX line is done pulling it low. The way to set up then this networking is you configure your UR channel to nine bit mode, which is, as the name suggests is just instead of sending eight data bits, we send nine data bits. Configure it to nine bit mode. And the ninth bit is used to indicate whether the message that was put onto the bus is data or an address. So every other device on in the network can see every transmission. And if that ninth bit indicates this is an address, then it will check the value of that address against its own hard coded address. And if it's a match, then it will automatically put itself into receive transmit mode so that it can communicate which, with whichever device addressed it. And then that address is persistent until some other device changes the address. So a little weird, it's, it, it, <laughs> you, you see every transmit and receive line on the same wire and your first thought is what? But uh, yeah, it's, it's not too mysterious. This is by default high, like we want. And then the TX lines can toggle the line low. Okay, so I wanna look at the code. Before I do, I wanna talk just for a moment about why we actually have to be thoughtful about writing code that communicates over these, this UART channel. Because um, there are some built-in functions in standard IO that you all have been using extensively um, and that are really common to use, but we have to be a little bit careful with them for reasons that I'll talk about. So these are the functions that are by now very, very familiar to all of you. Printfs, right? We use this to print data to either a PuTTY terminal or to your Python user interface. Um, sprintf sends formatted data to a string instead of to standard out. And then sscanf reads data input from standard in. So if you were to send data into your PIC, uh, you could get the data from standard in from sscanf. If, if I think you've got a typo here. I think it's sscanf uh, scans a character string, but scanf alone scans standard in. Oh, I think you're right. Thank you. But there's a worse problem with this particular compiler, and that is the compiler does not correctly generate scanf code. And if you use scanf for input, you will find that it pukes out an unending list of integers, crashes the machine and runs through memory. This caused me a good deal of pain a few years ago. So there's a, there's a workaround. I wrote a workaround. Use it. Don't use scan. You can use scanf. That's fine. Do not use scanf. So what you need to be careful about with all of these is you need to remember that these are blocking. So in the case that you call printf, your CPU is going to stop at that printf line until the print is complete. Now for prints, maybe that's okay because at least you can bound those, right? At least you know, okay, I'm gonna print two characters at 115200 baud rate. At least I know how long that operation is going to take. Um, it's still gonna take a long time incidentally, which is why when you ultimately want to get your number of voids as high as you possibly can. You wanna strip out things like print statements because they're a waste of time. But what's particularly scary are these functions that read from some sort of a user input because you might wait for some user or some device to send you input forever, right? So what you really want while you're waiting for, for some new piece of serial data is for the CPU to run off and execute other things, do other threads, and then only come back and get the data when there's actually data available. But naively implemented, that's not necessarily the case, right? You, you could set it up such that your CPU just stops and waits forever for the user to enter some piece of information, which by the way, is sometimes what you want. This isn't, it's not universally the case that you don't want that. 
like for example, if you are writing some sort of a uh, some sort of a physics simulation, and you need initial conditions, you don't want the simulation to start until you have the initial conditions, right? So it makes sense to sit and wait forever until the dumb slow user enters in the initial conditions, and then you start the simulation. But there are also circumstances where that's not what you want. You have some sort of user input and you want for the CPU to be executing other things while you wait for the next piece of input. Input. An example of this would be something like a video game, right? Maybe your user input for a video game comes through a serial terminal. You want for the dynamics of the game to continue to get executed between button pushes by the human, right? You want for if it's a ball game, you want the balls to continue to bounce around, right? While the user waits to slide the little slider or something. So we need to be careful about blocking and non-blocking. And I'm gonna, I'm, motiv I'm saying all this to motivate the code that we're about to look at. Um, anybody have questions or comments about this? Okay. So the code that I wanna look at, this is the, the file that you all started with. And on one of the first lectures of this class, I pointed at this line and said, uh, in this line, What's actually going on here is some other thread is getting spawned. And what that thread does is get information from the UART receive buffer and put it into this character array uh, called PT term buffer. And I said we would talk about that at some point and I wanna kind of talk about it now. So if we look into the proto threads header file, we can see how receipt of UART is actually done here. And there are two, there are two UART receive threads, one for human input and one for machine input. And they're different for a good reason. I wanna talk through the human input one first, and then I'll talk through the machine one if there's time. If not, I'll talk about it next time or another time. But in any case, I wanna start by looking at this get serial buffer thread that you can spawn to get human serial input. Um, the first thing that we see above above the instantiation of this thread is a bunch of pound defines with these wildly cryptic looking um, strings of characters. These are ASCII escape sequences. So you are all familiar with some ASCII escape, escape sequences. Like you all are likely aware that forward slash N is a new line, forward slash R is a carriage return. There's a whole library of other ones. And you can look at tables of these and put together these messages to configure a, a receiving terminal in a certain way. You can move the cursor around, you can change text color, text size, these sorts of things. So that's all that's going on here is we're defining a bunch of these ASCII escape sequences. And then we drop into the buffer itself. The first thing that you'll notice is if you were curious in your code, where is PT term buffer actually coming from? It's defined in this proto threads header file. It's defined here. This is a character array of some length. And this is the array into which we put the data that we receive over the UART channel. Um, we initialize a couple of static variables, one character. This is going to, where we're going to store the character that is, that is currently in the UART receive buffer. The other is num character. We're gonna keep track of the number of characters that we've received. We begin the thread. Zero the number of characters because we haven't received any yet. Clear the buffer where we're going to store the received information and then drop into this loop. And for as long as the number of characters that we've received is less than the length of that receive buffer, there's gonna be under other conditions under which we break out of this while loop. But for as long as that's the case, this is what we do. We will yield until there is data available in our UART receive buffer. So I mentioned, and people have noticed that that Python's, and by, well, I mentioned that that Python serial thread does not have a yield in it. And the reason for that is it's spawning a thread and the thread that it's spawning has a yield in it. Now the thread that it's actually spawning is the one beneath this, beneath this which is the get machine buffer. Okay, but in any case, this child thread is yielding until there's data available in the UART buffer. When there's data available, it gets that byte that's in the buffer and puts it into the character variable. 
It then yields until the UART transmitter is ready because in the case of human input, we echo the characters back to the user and then it sends the byte back to the user. All that it next does is look at the value of that byte and take one of a few actions based on that value. If it has received a carriage return, which is the user pressing the enter button, it interprets that as the end of some message from the user and it, um, it, retur it, it returns PT term buffer to the program to be used by the, by the uh, program. And then it will yield, it'll send a new, it'll yield until the transmitter is ready and then send a new line so that, um, so that the next information that you send into the user terminal is on a new line. It takes different action if there's a backspace, okay? And then it increments the number of characters received. What you'll notice here is that if we are listening to UART data from a human typing into a keyboard, we are yielding between every entrance of the user. Why? Because humans with our big dumb meat fingers are so slow compared to the CPU that we might as well have the CPU run off and do other stuff while we wait for the big dumb slow human to move their finger to the next key. This is, we're not gonna have time to talk about it today, but this is what's different about receiving from some other device where that dead is coming in fast. If it's coming in from a human, yeah, yield between key presses because they're so long as far as the CPU is concerned, that it might as well do other stuff. Um, if you are receiving UART from a device like your Python script, then we don't do that. Then we wait until we see that carriage return, that end of uh, message signature, and then we yield. But we'll talk about that another time because we're out of time right now. Do people have questions about this? I feel like today was a little maybe fast, faster than usual. I'm not sure why. Maybe I drank too much coffee, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I had a quick question. Yeah. So earlier you said that the print statements were blocking. Um, does that include interrupts? Or is that simply just the main thread? So the, the interrupt will interrupt a print. Hmm. But so the timer gets updated correctly, but nothing else, you're not using any other interrupts or, or if you have the synthesis, audio synthesis will work. Okay, One thing yeah, I wanna to add to the, to the UART's uh, uh, error discussion is that this particular implementation on the PIC32 locks the UART if it gets an error. And if you, until you unlock the UART, nothing more gets received. Some students discovered this because some brands of GPS receiver communicate over UART and they're not very good. They lock the, they throw an error about every third transmission and they kept, so, 10 times a second, they would lock the CPU. Great, had to figure out how to unlock it. You will see in the machine code that before every transmission, the UART uh, uh, errors are unlocked. And why is that? It's because the reset command locks the UART. It's an error. But because that reset command is just a break condition, you can fire up any, you can point any Python code, even one that's for a previous lab or for an unrelated lab at the correct COM port and open it up. And the reset will still work because it's just sending a break condition. 